Today, the first official day of LCA. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Richard Fontana. Uh, as a gentleman whose work I myself uh, have followed uh, for some time. Um, Richard is a lawyer by trade um, and an open source, uh, who specialises in open source. Um, he's been working in the field for probably about uh, just over a decade or so now. Um, so it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Richard to talk about taking licence compatibility semi-seriously. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, Thanks for coming to this talk. It's, it's, uh, I'm not sure it's the, the best possible uh, topic for the end of the day, but, but I'll sort of do my best. This is a, a kind of an advanced um, open source legal topic, but it's also a um, sort of one of those, those issues that you're, you're supposed to know about if you want to know a little bit about um, open source licensing. And open source licensing is, is sort of uh, one of the fundamental pieces of, of um, the collection of things that we think of as open source legal issues. Um, so I want to, before this gets too um, confusing, I want to try to to identify what I think the, the basic issue is with license compatibility. Um, because I think that that the issue itself is kind of clear, that um, you, you in potentially encounter license compatibility situations or incompatibility situations if you are developing software, uh, open source software, and you have um, some code that's under, you're using that's under one license, some code that's under another license, and some issue arises about the juxtaposition of the two licenses. It isn't necessarily that they, they conflict in some way. That's, that's a little bit unclear. That's where it sort of starts to get unclear. But that's the, that's the issue that you have to look out for. That's something that you know, kind of lawyers will do is, is sort of do this issue spotting. And, and that's, that's the issue that you have to spot. So I think that, that part uh, itself is, is clear. Um, so I want to talk uh, a little bit about copyright and licensing just to kind of, uh, as a sort of baseline background for this topic. So copyright is, is the area of law, for better or worse, that, that um, open source licensing is, is built on top of primarily. Um, copyright is a form of property rights that, that the state gives to authors um, in um, creative works, uh, original works of expression. And um, the property right consists of exclusive rights. That basically means the right to stop people from doing certain things. And those rights kind of map pretty well to the kinds of things we want to give um, users um, and developers the, the right to do with open source software. So the right to make copies, the right to improve software the, uh, or, or other material, the right to share things. That, that's all, that maps pretty well to the rights, the exclusive rights that are given to the copyright holder. Um, and um, licenses, so, so, so a license uh, is, uh, if you have a property right, a, a, an exclusive property right, you can grant permission to other people to exercise some of, uh, some portion of the rights that you have, so some of those exclusive rights. And that, that uh, exercise of permission is called a license. Um, licenses are very often conditional, so you have some strings attached to the, the grant of permission. So for example, I could, I could be a copyright owner and give you permission to, um, let's say I wrote a poem, I have copyright on it, give you permission to um, publish it on you know, one particular day of the week, on, on Monday. So that's a, that's a copyright license. And, and open source licenses are fundamentally copyright licenses, even though they, they implicate explicitly or implicitly other rights as well. They're primarily about giving these uh, copyright permissions. And the, the, um, the, these con conditions that, that exist in the licenses are how we, um, we implement policies in, in open source licensing. So whether it's very permissive licenses or, or copyleft licenses, relatively restrictive licenses, it's through the conditions on these otherwise very permissive licenses that you um, implement the policies that you want to achieve if you're a developer. So I want to talk a little bit about how, um, how open source and free software is is different from other um, kind of domains of copyrighted material, because I think this is useful for understanding this otherwise very confusing topic. And it's also kind of worth thinking about in general. So one thing that's different is that um, we build open source software remarkably out of um, lots of different parts that authors, different authors have put under, under licenses. Um, you know, before you even decide that you want to get it, they're, they're under some license. Uh, I like to, think, to visualize this as a patchwork quilt. So like each square could be a, uh, a licensed thing that you want to use in your in your software. Uh, licenses are uh, increasingly standardized, so we don't really have a, a license proliferation problem anymore in open source. Um, most projects today are using kind of code under a small set of 
licenses. And, and the, that means that the kinds of legal issues that come up tend to be, they sort of repeat themselves from project to project, so they're not unique to particular projects. Uh, these licenses are not negotiated, so that's a, that's a really key thing about open source. The, these um, licenses are form licenses. They're kind of take it or leave it licenses. You don't get to kind of negotiate a special um, version of the GPL generally or a special version of the Apache license. You have to kind of take what you can get. And, and um, the, also, the licenses are, are all fairly similar from a very broad perspective. So um, even though we may think in, in our kind of universe that MIT license and the GPL are very like, like polar opposites from a policy perspective, from a broader standpoint, they're actually very similar. They, they're, they're very, you know, compared to traditional copyright licenses, they're very generous. They grant the same kinds of permissions. They all grant um, commercial freedom, for example, as John was, was saying in his talk. And then there's something that I, I started thinking about recently. Uh, is is that that in open source we use the same licenses on what I'm thinking of as inputs as well as outputs and and think of this patchwork quilt if it's easier to understand so I have a, a square that's you know someone put some code under a given license and then I put some code under a license and I want to combine them into you know one let's say one one project and um, I, I what we see with developers very often is this this tendency to use um, the same kind of license um, for you know one of those um, input squares on the output side. So I might use the MIT license. Someone I might use some code from someone else under the Apache license, and I might be tempted to put my two square combination under the MIT license um, uh, because that's the license I use. And, and maybe that's a problem. Maybe it's not un under a kind of compatibility uh, analysis. Um, one, one thing that's that's um, worth understanding so so the so compatibility is not about the the input side really it's about this what i'm thinking of as the output side you have combinations of those those squares in the in the patchwork quilt you have multiple pieces and um, the question is whether there's something problematic about putting the combination under a given license. It's, it's, it's a little more straightforward in, if the GPL is, is one of those licenses because there's a, an understanding that there's an obligation to put the combination under the GPL in at least some situations. Um, this, this, you might think that, that um, the, the background law of copyright or um, you know, software licensing in general, proprietary software licensing might provide some insight into this whole kind of issue of um, you know, juxtaposition of different con potentially conflicting uh, open source licenses, and, but they really don't. This is a, a unique um, open source specific um, phenomenon. It, it's, it, so there's, there's nothing corresponding to it in other, other copyright domains. There's, um, the closest we get is, so all copyright law contemplates creating works out of pre-existing works. That's a, a basic concept. Um, one of the rights you get as a copyright owner is the right to create derivative works, or in, in Australian law, I think the word is, um, uh, adaptations. Uh, these are works that are built on top of uh, pre-existing works. There's also compilations, so collections of, of existing, pre-existing works. That's kind of like what we have in, I mean, that is what we have in, in open source, but, but in other fields we don't have this use of pre-licensed um, material that is intended to be reused. So, so um, typically the way this is taken care of in other fields is you have, you either just sort of like assume you don't have a problem, you wait to be sued, or you do some kind of ad hoc copyright clearance when you're about to publish. This is kind of an example is hip hop where, where there's a lot of use of um, sampling of other people's music. And, and often there, there are copyright issues, but this is generally taken care of, uh, um, you know, traditionally at least, um, at the point of publication in an ad hoc kind of negotiated way. So that's not how it works in open source. So open source is, is something that, uh, open, so open source license compatibility is something that came out of a developer culture. It didn't come from the underlying legal system. It didn't come from lawyers or judges or courts. Uh, it, it was created by developers. That's a pretty key thing to understand. So, um, and, 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 and this, there have been attempts to talk about license compatibility in a, in a sort of generalized way, um, applicable to both copyleft situations and totally non-copyleft situations. And I think that's, that's actually very confusing. Um, the, the, this started out as a GPL cultural kind of phenomenon. It was GPL project developers who created this, this whole issue, uh, who recognized the issue and created the kind of body of um, doctrine around it. And it, 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 um, it, it, it can't really be understood well without kind of like thinking of it as primarily a GPL sort of issue. Um, and, and so the way it happened was um, developers 
of GPL project, you know, going back in history to like the 1990s, we're starting to use lots of um, code from other projects that were not using the GPL. They were using um, other free software licenses. And, and eventually they, they started asking the question whether there was any problem with this under uh, the terms of the GPL, GPL version two, which was the, the version of the GPL in, in use at that time. So this is, um, uh, I'll, I'll make the slides available and you can look at this um, later. Th these are the, the key provisions, some of the key provisions in, the, in GPLv2 that implement the copyleft policy. And these were what these developers were looking at. And so th these, are, these are designed, the, the goal of GPL is to prevent proprietization of free software. So these, these kinds of requirements, the requirement that derivative works be licensed under the same license, or the requirement that you not impose um, additional restrictions if you're distributing um, GPL license software. Those are key um, ways that, that um, co uh, copyleft is implemented and, and they're th part of the strategy for um, making sure that free software doesn't get proprietized. But developers started to ask whether this had any implications for combinations, that, you know, pure free combinations. So combinations of GPL code and non-GPL but free software code. Uh, and the way um, this all started was with one particular license, one particular non-GPL license, the, um, the original BSD license, which uh, is called today the Fort Clause BSD by um, some of us. And it, so it's a very permissive license and it's, it's not very remarkable other than the fact that it has this, this um, clause in it that, that says that you have to give credit to the copyright owner if you uh, publish an advertisement that um, mentions features of the software. So, um, GPL project developers, um, Alan Cox and the Linux kernel project was one example, started to ask this question whether um, this conflicted with the copyleft requirements of the GPL. You know, is this advertising requirement an additional restriction, essentially? I don't know if it was kind of formulated as a question that clearly, but that was basically the idea. And so a consensus gradually developed among the developers of these projects that, uh, that, that this was um, inconsistent with the GPL's requirements, this kind of provision. Now, what's interesting is that so so the uh, th there was a successful campaign um, uh, coming out of the free software community to get um, Berkeley, which was the main copyright holder using this license, um, to to um, rescind that clause, and and that's why it's, to this day we have the three clause BSD license, which is the same license with that clause removed and is still pretty widely used. There's this other clause in in the original BSD license that's still in the the three clause BSD license, which is uh, this anti endorsement. Um, clause and it's interesting that that that's that's been assumed to be GPL compatible because um, the, the the reasoning can't be that that um, one is sort of found within the GPL and the other isn't because both of these things are not in the GPL. You could argue that both of these are are additional restrictions. So it's just an illustration of the fact that that um, this is sort of uh, coming out of these communities and it's not necessarily a completely rationalized um, or logically consistent thing. I mean, you could argue, of course, that this is less burdensome than the advertising clause, the, the anti-endorsement clause. It's, it kind of makes more rational sense. There, there are arguments you can make. You could also make arguments, however, that the, the advertising clause is not necessarily inconsistent with the GPL, but those arguments did not kind of carry the day. Um, so what happened was the, um, um, the Free Software Foundation um, exercised a lot of leadership in, in articulating this, this, um, this area of, of doctrine of, of GPL license compatibility. They, they um, kind of pronounced on whether particular licenses were, were compatible with the GPL or not. And then they exercised a lot of influence um, you know, in, the, in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, when, when the GPL was, was really you know, clearly very, very much the dominant license in, in, in the open source and free software uh, world. And um, uh, they, they had a lot of effect on, on um, drafting of uh, new open source licenses. So, so um, many companies, for example, started writing their own open source licenses and the FSF might, uh, would kind of point out that, that, um, that they had GPL incompatible provisions and, and this would then become sort of a controversial thing that they'd had to address. Um, the, um, the FSF also used its influence over this area to shape um, the kinds of licenses that new projects selected. So, so new projects were sort of under pressure to pick GPL compatible licenses to a large extent. And kind of reflective of this era is this very famous essay uh, by David Wheeler, who's a, an open source uh, advocate in the US, uh, sort of US government sphere. Uh, he, he wrote this article um, saying that um, 
um, you know, pragmatically, you should pick a GPL compatible license for your project, even if you don't like the GPL, because otherwise, there is a lot of GPL um, GPL enthusiasts and among developers and users out there. And if um, you pick a GPL incompatible license, they might be tempted to uh, create a competitor project or, or or support a competitor project. So this was sort of uh, captured the spirit of the of the time. Um, I just included this because it, it, the, the FSF has tried to explain what, what compatibility um, means in a sort of general way, and I find this pretty dis, dissatisfying. I think it's hard to understand, so I, 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 you can read it later on. Um, it, I, I think it's sort of tautological, and it, it kind of um, sort of says essentially that, you know, two licenses are, are compatible if they're compatible, essentially. And, and so, so it's... It, 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 it kind of shows that, that there's something kind of confusing about this area. It hasn't been fully, you get the sense that it hasn't been fully worked out um, in a kind of analytical sense. Uh, so if you look at the, the, the things the FSF said about various licenses in terms of their compatibility or incompatibility of the GPL, you can then sort of try to extract a coherent doctrine from that. And I've, I've kind of tried to do this. And it's not entirely it's not an entirely successful thing because there, there is like inconsistency, but this is a set of um, you know, basic kinds of provisions that on the left-hand side that the FSF has, has said um, are, are problematic in, in, in that they're GPL incompatible. On the right-hand side are the kinds of categories of things that you find in free software licenses, open source licenses, that the FSF has said are GPL compatible. And, and a lot of the ones on the right-hand side were actually codified as a kind of explicitly compatible in GPL version three, but uh, you know some of these on the left hand side are, are sort of questionable. The um, I think the FSF has been inconsistent about some of these. Um, I, I, I believe that, for example, this issue of um, attribution requirements uh, that the, the FSF has said that you know some licenses with 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 very similar attribution requirements. In some cases, the FSF has said you know this one's compatible. In other cases, the FSF has said the you know otherwise similar kind of attribution license, the license is, is incompatible with the GPL, and there's nothing else in the licenses that seems to, to give rise to compatibility. So, so I, I think there's some inconsistency. Some of this is, from a policy standpoint, it's questionable, like choice of law clauses. Um, so it, it's very common in, in commercial, um, uh, I should say proprietary um, um, license agreements to have choice of law clauses, and that sort of gives um, interpretive guidance to kind of apply the law of a given country to sort of simplify the legal issues. And I think the, the FSF's view is, was that um, this is potentially dangerous because you could select the law of a country that's very hostile to free software. And I think that's it's kind of, um, you know, in, in, first of all, I think it's actually kind of unrealistic um, because I think um, worldwide there's sort of this, I, I don't know if there's really countries that are, that are particularly more hostile to free software in their copyright law than others. But, but also, um, uh, you know, so so the the um, I want to talk about about two of 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 these that that are particularly worth knowing about um, clashing copyleft requirements. So so one of the basic principles that that everyone basically accepts is that that two two copyleft requirements that are different. So a license A says that you have to license derivative works under license A. Uh, and license B says you have to license derivative works under license B, that if you, tr you combine code into one sort of like meaningful unit, that um, that potentially creates a, a, a conflict and, and an incompatibility, at least on the, if one of the licenses is the GPL. And so this, is, this seems fairly straightforward, although you can imagine developing a, an interpretive approach that would harmonize um, two different uh, seemingly clashing copyleft requirements. Um, and so, you know, we have this sort of basic understanding that like GPL v2 by default is incompatible with, with GPL v3 and, and sort of vice versa. Um, the other one I want to mention is uh, the, the Apache license. So, so th this is kind of a well-known and pretty influential thing. The, the FSF uh, decided that the, the um, Apache license 2.0 is incompatible with GPL version 2, and there was a lot of effort made to make GPL version 3, um, to make the Apache license compatible with GPL version 3 through, through changes that were made in GPL version 3. Uh, the, the rationale, I think, is, is um, sort of has to do with the, the patent license grant and the Apache license. So in, in the Apache license, you have an explicit patent license grant, and GPL v2 doesn't say anything explicit about granting patent licenses. And under the Apache license, there's a what's called a patent piece provision, where if you 
if you bring, uh, if you have patents and you bring um, patent lawsuit against um, essentially accusing the licensed software of patent infringement, uh, essentially kind of an act of patent aggression, uh, you can then, you, know, you lose your patent license that you got under the Apache license. And the FSF said that this, this gives rise to um, incompatibility under GPLv2. And, and the, the rationale is something I continue to, to sort of not understand. And I think it's just sort of, um, I've had, I, there, there's one person I know who's, who's tried to, who, who does think this makes sense and he's tried to explain it to me. And every time he explains it, I, I think it sort of like makes sense momentarily. But then when I think about it an hour later, I, I think it sort of doesn't make sense. And, and it's sort of inconsistent with, with, with what the FSF has said about some other issues. So, so the FSF has said that licenses that explicitly say you don't get a patent license at all, are GPL compatible, so CC0 is an example of that. And I don't see how you can really distinguish those two things, because it's actually you're in a worse situation, potentially, if you have a license that says you don't get a patent license at all. And this, this had a, it just continues to have a pretty remarkable um, impact many years later. Um, two of the, the licenses that were recently um, approved by the Open Source Initiative were efforts to create uh, GPLv2 compatible permissive licenses with patent license grants, like the Apache license. Um, so I, I mentioned that this is primarily a GPL area. Th there have been efforts to kind of generalize this. The FSF um, itself has, has tried to kind of generalize the phenomenon, and, and other people have in recent years as well. So is there sort of a general kind of phenomenon of, of licensing compatibility that applies to non-GPL areas as well, as well as the GPL. So you know, is the MIT license incompatible or compatible with the ISC license or vice versa? This is a question that people never used to ask because they just sort of assumed this was a totally GPL problem. And of course you could have like code that was totally permissively licensed and you have like some code under one permissive license and some code under another. Uh, more recently people have tried to kind of generalize license compatibility and they've talked about this concept of one-way compatibility. and. Um, I, I think it's, I don't think it's, it's very coherent. I mean, the idea is that, that um, the way I've heard it expressed by some people is that you have a more permissive license and you have a more restrictive license and you wanna see if you can use the more permissive stuff in your more restrictively licensed project. And the way you do that is you kind of line up the different requirements in the two licenses. And if you, the, the idea is that if you can comply with both licenses by adhering to the more restrictive license, then that tells you that the two licenses are one way compatible in the sense that the more permissive one is compatible in the direction of the more restrictive one, but not vice versa, because, because it doesn't work in the other direction. And the, the problem with this is it seems like it, it's applying a, a GPL kind of copyleft framework to situations where, where none of the, the kind of assumptions of the GPL framework apply. So you don't have this requirement in, in a purely permissive license scenario or even weak copyleft scenarios where you have to license a whole combination under a single license. So, so I find this, this quite kind of confusing and, and dissatisfying. Uh, and, and I think um, w w one reason why I think this, this, um, there's been this temptation to, to um, generalize license compatibility is that in, in the pure permissive or, or pure non-GPL scenario, there's this discomfort with uh, the fact that, that, which is very common in open source, that you have multiple pieces under, under multiple licenses. As I've said, you know, this is a, a basic feature of, of open source development. And I think people are kind of troubled by that the appearance of complexity and they want to try to simplify the licensing posture of their project. So they'd like to be able to say this combination of uh, you know, Apache and MIT is all under the Apache license or all under the MIT license, which intuitively the latter makes a little less sense to me. But I think that's what's kind of going on there. But it's not, it doesn't totally make um, analytical sense to me. Now, so you have this kind of like um, developer created, um, FSF influenced, you know, non-legal system created doctrine, which is kind of confusing in some ways. And then there's this, this um, body of what I consider tricks to circumvent these things. And, and I used to say when I gave this talk like a couple of times before, I said that this, these tricks are kind of well known to some people who are, um, you know, conversant with this stuff. And I actually think that that's maybe an exaggeration. I think a lot of these things are, are, are known to kind of a, a pretty narrow set of people. A lot of these things I'm, I call tricks are, 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 are more well known to people who are active in like community Linux distributions, so like Debian and Fedora. But I think they're, they're less well known um, in, uh, in, in other communities and other, other kinds of ecosystems, project ecosystems. So you can get around license compat incompatibility in various ways, at least on the GPL side. So you can argue, um, you can always argue that there's mere aggregation. So the GPL 
uh, is not a viral license, uh, contrary to what some people say. It's, it's, um, it explicitly limits the copyleft scope by saying that two you know, sufficiently independent pieces can be distributed together. Uh, one can be under the GPL, one could potentially be proprietary, and there's no problem because, of, because that's just mere aggregation. So you could try to argue that in a, in a situation where you might otherwise potentially worry about licensing compatibility. Uh, there's a thing in the GPL called the uh, system library exception. And it's basically an exception to the source code requirement. And uh, Linux distributions have tried to use this to argue that, for example, OpenSSL, which um, up to this point, although it's, it's in the process of relicensing to the Apache license, OpenSSL has been under a, a license that has an advertising clause like the old BSD license. So, so that's a lot of GPL uh, license programs um, uh, have OpenSSL crypto libraries as a dependency. So um, many, many people in, in community Linux distributions worry about the licensing compatibility, but many of them are, are satisfied that, well, this is taken care of because this is uh, uh, covered by the system library exception, even though it doesn't quite make sense if you try to read the, the system library exception closely. And, and in a sense, it's, it's kind of uh, expedient because in a way you could argue anything in a Linux distribution is uh, a system library. Um, you can, and this is sort of a best practice from the FSF standpoint, you can try to get the GPL licensors, copyright holders of a project to grant an additional permission or an exception, and this is what some projects do. But the problem there is that you have these transaction costs because you have to sort of ask the project to do that because they might not have realized that there was a potential problem. Uh, you can also, and this is maybe less, less well accepted, but I, I've certainly, I think this is entirely legitimate, you can infer the equivalent of an exception through the conduct of a project. So if I have a GPL project that I've started and, I, and from the beginning I uh, use um, OpenSSL, um, the only person who could complain about an incompatibility is me on the GPL side, and uh, because there's no incompatibility argument on the, in the other direction. The OpenSSL project doesn't claim that, that, that you know, they're, they're, actually that's a bad example. Um, uh, there, there is this weird thing in the open. So, so no, I think it works out. Open SSL. There's, there's, but it, there's a complication here that I'm overlooking. Fortunately, we can we can forget about this once they relicense. But um, uh, so you, you can infer this is, general point is valid. You can infer for permission through conduct. And the problem with this, though, is that as as the GPL um, side gets more diverse in terms of copyright owners, if you start using GPL code from other projects on the GPL side, it becomes harder to argue that this works out. Uh, you, can, um, you can argue that the incompatible thing is unenforceable. You can, you can look for um, similar versions of the same code that might have earlier been or later been under a different license that is compatible uh, in your situation. And, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this phenomenon of relicensing clauses. So, so more recent complex licenses often take care of this issue through um, relicensing clauses. These are clauses that explicitly say, you know, they, they, they try to deal with this problem of, of compatibility by saying you can, you can basically just relicense the code um, under this other license. Um, and so that, that's going to create compatibility. And that's sort of a, considered a best practice uh, for, for modern, um, you know, certainly non-GPL copyleft licenses. Um, one of the, the problems here is that it, it's not really clear what relicensing means in, in a legal sense. Relicensing is, is another one of these concepts that emerged uh, out of uh, legal custom in free software and open source communities. So it, it, it's, when you say you're relicensing a project to another license, I don't think that that necessarily means that the original uh, conditions of the upstream license disappear, unless you're, you're, there, there's something that really explicitly says that. So, there's, there's, this is a rare case of a, a license that has a relicensing clause. This is the EUPL, uh, which is not a very widely used license unless you're a, a bureaucrat in uh, Brussels. But, but it, it has a, a, a clause that, that takes care of this in a pretty well-written way. But m most relicensing clauses sort of ignore this issue um, of like what relicensing really means and what happens to the original incompatible condition. Uh, and, and so really aggravating is um, uh, this is on the, on the FSF's um, um, FAQ or, or, or their, their, yeah, I think their, their, their list of um, licenses. Uh, maybe it's their FAQ. And, and uh, I, I think I understand that this is this is a result of uh, my former boss, Evan Moglen, when he was still a lawyer for the FSF. So he came up with a clever argument for why uh, there was a license, actually the EUPL again, which discriminated against um, GPLv3 and its compatibility clause, its relicensing clause. So you couldn't relicense to GPLv3. 
But um, Eben came up with a very clever argument for using an intermediate license. And you, so using a, a relicensing clause in a different license and then doing another relicensing on the EP, EUPL side. So two steps of relicensing. And it's, this sort of, I, I hope, kind of conveys that, that, that this is sort of like very clever and kind of impressive, but, but, but kind of disturbing um, trickery. And then sort of related to this is this notion of, of uh, what I think some people call an effective license. So, you know, GPLv2 or later, um, which is how GPLv2 code is mostly licensed, is considered compatible with GPLv3 because of this idea that you can relicense the GPLv2 code to GPLv3. You have that permission to upgrade to the other license. So people see combinations of GPLv2 or later code and GPLv3 code, and um, um, they say, okay, that's, that's compatible because of, of, of the ability to upgrade. And I think that that makes sense, but but you know uh, no one ever actually does the relicensing. It's also the the um, the original um, relicensing clause uh, was the one in the LGPL. And the LGPL says you can use LGPL code in GPL projects as long as you change all the license notices. And so people see that as the basis for why um, LGPL is GPL uh, compatible. But no one actually ever does the step of changing the license notices. So it's sort of a theoretical entirely theoretical thing. And, and this can get, like, I've really pushed this idea pretty, pretty far. I don't know if other people have uh, uh, themselves. But, but, you know, so you can take, like, LGPLv2 and the Apache license. They're supposed to be um, incompatible um, in the sort of pre-GPLv3 world. But because you can upgrade LGPLv2 to GPLv3 because of that, that special clause in the original LGPL, and because the Apache license is now considered GPLv3 compatible, you can say that that combination is altogether a compatible thing because um, potentially it could all be under GPLv3. So the effective license is GPLv3, but it's, it's effective in a way that no one ever actually sees because no one's ever going to actually do the relicensing in an explicit way. It's, it's, it's experienced by the user as a combination of two separate licenses. So there's no actual relicensing. It's entirely imaginary. So that's, that's kind of you know, aggravating. Um, so uh, maybe I've, I've already kind of suggested uh, why there's some things that are, are kind of wrong with this um, whole area. So we, we have this, what, what feels like, like almost an unnecessarily complex doctrinal area. Uh, it's not entirely consistent. It's not entirely rationally worked out. And then you have this um, bag of tricks that you can resort to, um, also kind of coming out of developer communities, um, I think, and maybe to some degree legal communities. Um, but, but certainly not, not very much like a homegrown kind of bag of tricks for circumventing these complex sets of rules. And, and that, it makes you wonder whether this is all kind of maybe a, a waste of time. And, 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 and there are some policy concerns. So, so this, this just gives um, uh, a, an argument for um, emphasizing legal risk around um, open source, which is what, what um, many of us uh, on the commercial side wrestle with. There, there, there are companies that kind of profit from the perception of risk around Around um, around open source and and they they use the, they really use this concept of license compatibility to kind of scare people. There are companies that, that have tools, proprietary tools, that try to spot license incompatibility uh, scenarios in, in your code and and so you have things like that. You um, some of these tricks that I talked about um, ha sort of assume that you have concentrated copyright control, which many of us consider suboptimal. Uh, and um, there are also projects that have used this uh, doctrine, um, sort of non-GPL projects, basically, have used this doctrine against the GPL using community. So they will pick a GPL incompatible license on purpose to prevent sharing with GPL communities. And that, that's kind of disturbing, right? Uh, so what we see um, you know, in recent years, I've seen a lot of these license compatibility charts. And I mean, you, you can, you know, I, I shouldn't say you shouldn't look at this closely because you, you should try to look at it and, and make up your own mind about it. But, but I think you see the, the complexity that this emphasizes and, and it, you kind of get the impression that this is all a very difficult system. If you want to use the, the GPL, certainly, you have to learn all these very complicated uh, rules. And there's one that I saw more recently that's even worse than that. And, and there's a lot that's really questionable in, in this chart, but it's, it's just like really remarkable how complex um, the rule system um, can be if you, if you kind of believe in all this stuff very, very kind of religiously. Um, so, and you can, you can understand uh, why some developers might use this as a kind of justification for why they prefer permissive over, over GPL licensing. So they, you know, GPL licensing is, 
is um, so complicated. You have to learn all these um, rules about compatibility. You have to look at these compatibility charts. And, that, and why not just use a permissive license like the MIT license or something like that, since it's all very simple. And, and actually, that previous chart shows that it's not necessarily simple, because there are actually some complicated rules here on the purely permissive side. Like you know, supposedly, the ISC license is compatible with the BSD three clause license, but not vice versa, according to that chart. And I think that's questionable. But so maybe this is not actually just on the GPL, GPL side after all. And what's, what's also further kind of um, disturbing about all this is that in, in the real world, it's not clear that a lot of this really matters anyway. Because, because um, actually, most projects don't pay attention to any of this. And so obviously, some projects do. And some projects will care about it if you bring the, an issue of license incompatibility to their attention. But there's lots of projects that just don't adhere to the um, expectations that seem to be implied by those kinds of license compatibility charts. That's the rule, not the exception. That's what I see, you know, I have to say, in, in Linux distributions, in packages that we all use and, and distribute, um, it's hard to kind of reconcile what's going on in those, those packages from a license uh, standpoint uh, from a strict sort of license compatibility framework. You can't kind of map what's actually going on to those complex license compatibility charts. So, so these aren't really being adhered to in the real world, and no one really sees uh, a problem with that for the most part. Um, so the, these rules aren't really followed. And, and, and another thing is that the, the provisions that cause incompatibility are, are I mean, no one ever really enforces on them. So for, think of the advertising clause. Um, that's never been invoked by anyone, as far as I know. Um, I don't know who like, would, would implicate the advertising clause by publishing an advertisement, but, but that's never been invoked. And, and something like the Apache license and the GPLv2 incompatibility, you know, th these patent license Grants are, are actually, I mean, no one really knows any example where they've ever been invoked, where anyone's revoked a patent license grant under the Apache license in any situation that might be relevant to this issue of, of um, whether it's GPLv2 compatible or not. So um, you know, why does this, this kind of confusing and kind of um, complex, overly complex situation exist? Uh, I, I, don't, I can give some insight into why I think, um, even though this didn't come out of lawyer communities originally, lawyers involved in open source have given support to this doctrine. Um, I wouldn't say that, that I have, but, 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 some, but lawyers, a lot of lawyers who specialize in this, kind of, they, they love this stuff. They love those charts. And I think it's because you know, this is not like a normal area of legal practice. So normally, um, lawyers will have some kind of area of regulation that they specialize in, or, or um, you know, like financial regulation, securities regulation, or, or some area of, of real, um, real significant um, litigation risk, like patent litigation. Um, open source is just not like that, and I think that's a good thing because the, the, the risk is just like really small, and we don't have courts dealing with a lot of GPL or other open source license cases. And so all you have is, you know, the closest thing you have to a body of regulation is like the FSF's FAQ. And so, so there's a temptation for people involved in this field to kind of elevate that to the same like level as, uh, I don't know, securities regulations for a securities lawyer or, or something like that. And I think that's, that, that's what I think is kind of going on like uh, unconsciously on the lawyer side. On the developer side, I don't know. I mean, I think developers then might see this on, um, from, from uh, lawyers. And, and some developers, I think, give too much credibility to what lawyers say, even though they're, they're kind of just like regurgitating things that have come out of developer communities. Um, I think some developers might find um, this sort of like intricate rules kind of system appealing in some way. I don't know. Uh, but that's what I, I speculate. Um, a defense of of, um, of this this area of doctrine. So so there there is a defense. It's it's that this this um, this system of license compatibility doctrine is is helpful because it 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 shores up the GPL um, copyleft interpretation for when you actually need it the most, which is in um, copyleft proprietary combinations. And so and and I think that's that's a good argument, but it, it's not. Um, it's not inevitable. You could have two different um, interpretations for the two different scenarios, potentially. Uh, so, so that brings us to, to um, the, the most interesting controversy over license compatibility in recent years is this um, decision by Ubuntu to ship a, a um, ZFS kernel module out of tree, of course, um, in, in Ubuntu. And so ZFS is under a, a non-GPL um, weak copyleft license called Cuddle. Um, and some, uh, um, some speculate that Sun Microsystems picked that license you know, to prevent use by Linux and G GPL communities. Uh, so there was this dispute between Software Freedom Conservancy and um, Software Freedom Law Center 
over this issue. So, so Conservancy said, um, you know, what I was just sort of saying about the, the, the defense of license compatibility, that, that um, this is a straightforward GPL violation. You have to apply the same um, analysis to um, pure free software combinations as you would to GPL proprietary combinations. And SFLC said that, you know, yes, technically it's a GPL violation, but it's, it's consistent with the equity of the GPL, and, and SFLC sort of made up that concept. But it's like, it's sort of, it's sort of like the spirit of the GPL. And um, so if, if, unless the, the developers on the GPL side, so in that case it's, it's the kernel, unless the kernel developers object, um, it should be okay to proceed as though this is, this is um, okay. And, and that's, I think there's a lot of problems with that analysis. It's, it's sort of, um, it, it, it's, it, for one thing, there's no one, in, in the specific case of the kernel, there's no one person who can speak authoritatively about, um, about whether to grant like that permission or not, or, or to recognize that that as a problem or not uh, on the on the GPL side. So, so no one can speak authoritatively for the kernel. So it sort of is is unfairly generous to uh, a company in the situation like like Canonical. But there's there is something I think appealing about about the the analysis that SFLC is is using. And um, so I, I don't, I'm not good at coming up with um, constructive suggestions, but, but the, 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 the SFLC argument is a little bit like, like an idea that I've come up with that, that maybe it would be a good idea for the GPL side to relax its whole approach to, to this. Of course, this is what's happening de facto anyway by projects, but, but to the extent that projects actually do come really adhere to this idea that, that these rules matter, um, why not relax the rules as long as you're, um, getting the equivalent of um, what you would get if in, a, in a pure sort of GPL scenario in terms of source code under a free software license. So treat the, the, the incompatibility as sort of an, an, an unimportant, relatively unimportant technicality because you're, you're getting complete corresponding source code. This is kind of influenced by um, one of the things I call tricks that the FSF has, has recommended. Uh, the project on the GPL side can grant an additional permission or an exception that says, um, you know, you have permission to link to an incompatibly licensed library as long as um, you provide source code for the whole thing, including the, the GPL incompatible part. So that can be the basis for a more um, um, uh, informal kind of liberalized approach to things. And, and it doesn't need to weaken the, the force of GPL copyleft on the proprietary GPL side. So that can be just as strong. You're just creating a more liberalized kind of regime in a pure uh, uh, um, free software open source scenario. So um, that is, uh, I'm going to leave it there. That's all I got. I think I'm almost out of time. And um, I don't know if there's time for questions. But uh, if not, I can take questions outside. Um, there is three minutes okay. left if anyone, anyone, does have a, anyone does have a question. There is three minutes left. Only off topic questions. Uh, slightly off topic. Um, if I'm a developer and I have a, a GPL v2, why would I want to change the GPL v3 in you know, two sentences? That's oh, that's, I think John Sullivan is probably best, best equipped to yeah, could you repeat this? Oh, yeah, so the, I mean, the question is, is, is if you, it's sort of like, kind of off topic. Um, uh, if, if, you, if you have, if you have G, your GPLv2 project developer, why would you want to switch to GPLv3? I recommend that rather than tr attempt to answer that myself, talk to John Sullivan or go to the FSF um, or their, their website, and there's probably a lot of good materials on that. Um, there are actually some pretty good arguments for why you would want to switch to um, GPLv3. Um, for example, uh, GPLv3 has a, has a, a more um, forgiving approach to termination. Um, although you can adopt a policy like that on the GPLv2 side, as, as Red Hat has done recently, um, and some other companies. Any other? Yeah. Uh, I know you said not to be totally the, the compatibility charts, but I couldn't help noticing that both the charts um, show uh, LGPL 2.x compatible with GPL 2 and GPL 3. Yes. No, so it's it's because it's an odd thing. In the original LGPL has this this um, this special um, it's kind of a re I said the original relicensing clause. It says that you can upgrade, uh, in a sense, not just to GPL v2, which was contemporaneous to the original LGPL, but also to future versions of the GPL. So, um, so in in that instance, the FSF took care of this this um, problem of upgradability, it's got kind of like built-in upgradability to future versions where normally the FSF's policy has been to leave that up to the uh, discretion of the licensor. So, so it's actually in, I mean, if you want to read the, the original LGPL, it's very, 
uh, complex license, but you'll find it in section three. So it's worth taking a look at. Yeah. Um, honestly, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if there are. Um, I would not be inclined myself to seek them out, and so that's why I don't know the answer to that question. I just know that there are these tools on the proprietary side. Um, so I, I honestly don't know. So the, the question is, is uh, about AGPL adoption. Um, also not really like on topic for this, for this, for this talk. Um, I, I think the answer is I don't really see much adoption of AGPL. I, I think people are, are still kind of concerned about the policy problem, maybe even more now than ever before, about um, network services and, and the problem of like ineffective, um, how, how the GPL is sort of approach to copyleft is ineffective in a network services uh, context, but, but I, don't, I don't see AGPL as having been that successful in terms of getting adoption. There's certainly a, a, a fair number of projects that have picked that license. So that's actually all the time that we have. Um, uh, Richard will be around, so you can always grab him and have a discussion. I think he's quite happy to talk licensing with you. Um, on behalf of LCA, thank you very much, Richard, for coming uh, all the way over to us. And there's our present. Thank you. Um.